Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the first Asterix event of the fall term. I'm Lee Burkus, the current director of Asterix, the Faculty of Fine Arts' research center dedicated to supporting the research and creation of objects, narratives, and experiences, which investigate the intersections of art, sound, and technologies which is a rather long way of saying that Asterix brings together educators, researchers, students, artists, and the community at large to work across disciplines, fostering training and mentorship and collaborative research opportunities. Grants are for everyone, how to apply, what you're here for today, is part of our annual intersection series, student-focused workshops geared towards supporting common research challenges. This year, graduate assistant Tyler Stewart is leading this series and workshop. Tyler's a curator, writer, and master of arts candidate in cultural, social, and political thought. His research focuses on the role of sound within the ongoing structure of settler colonialism in Canada, investigating how sound is used as a form of social control and how artists use sound as a form of resistance. His focus with Asterix is to foster a variety of events and activities to encourage interdisciplinary collaboration in the arts. On that note, please welcome Tyler, our tour guide for the evening. First, first step, take myself off of mute. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Lee. Um, so my style is relatively informal, so I'll try to keep this relatively informal. Um, like Lee said, I am uh, currently an MA student. Uh, I used to be, or I guess almost 10 years ago now, I was a, under, did my undergrad at uh, the U of L as well. So I'm happy to help other students um, kind of learn from my experiences to get funding and to navigate some of the, um, you know, obstacles and barriers and fun pathways that the that academia can present. Um, so as we're starting here, if you want to fill out the poll that has popped up, that'll help me kind of maybe slightly tailor uh, the, um, the uh, workshop as we go on. Um, but I also want to say okay and welcome and to uh, acknowledge that we are gathered here in virtual space and in physical space on Blackfoot land. Um, and um, to acknowledge that the university's Blackfoot name is Inniskim, which means sacred buffalo stone. Um, and I won't read the kind of typical um, U of L uh, land acknowledgement, but say that it's important to me um, to acknowledge that we are gathered on Blackfoot land and also that I've been really appreciative of my experiences here, uh, the indigenous uh, friendships, uh, collaborations, um, and places I've been able to experience while I've been in Lethbridge uh, for 10 years now. Um, and I encourage all settler people and newcomers to this area to also acquaint themselves with uh, Blackfoot culture, history, traditions, and ways of knowing as well. Um, so, well, before we get really into the content here, I just want to say a couple of housekeeping things. If you are able to keep yourself on mute, unless you're directly asking a question, that would be great. Um, as you probably noticed, this session is being recorded and will be made available later on the Asterix website. Um, and we'll send out an email afterwards with the links that I'll go through in this presentation, as well as um, resources and that kind of thing. So don't worry about taking a million notes today, but you can if you wish. Um, also, um, feel free to turn your video on or off if you want, either is fine. Um, and as we go through the content, uh, feel free to just use the raise hand function. So if you click on participants, I believe is where you can click on the raise hand button. Um, if you want to ask a question, we don't need to wait till the end um, to ask questions. We can answer as we go through. Um, so with that, I'll see here that the poll shows me that 91% of the people here today are students. So I will definitely tailor this towards students. So I'm gonna talk about two different specific kinds of grants today, but I can share some other information about other grants that also applies to students. Um, but I'll focus primarily on AFA individual project grants. And uh, at the end, maybe I'll focus on uh, SHRC grants, which are only um, uh, eligible, or you're, you're only eligible to apply for SHRC, uh, the SHRC grant. I'll talk about if you are a graduate student. So that's probably the minority of people here. There's maybe more undergrads or uh, at least I'll start with the AFA grant since I feel that everyone here will probably be able to apply for that. So, 
Um, the first, I'll just do a little bit of an overview about kind of grants in general before we get uh, into the details of these two specific grants. But the first piece of advice I want to give today with any grant is to start early. Um, don't get yourself overwhelmed by the whole grant application process. Take things little by little and um, do it in chunks rather than scrambling to put together an application at the last minute. Um, any grant that you're scrambling to put together at the last minute will likely be less well-written and less organized, which also means you're less likely to be successful with that grant application. So start early. Um, that at the same time, um, I would say that it's always worth it to apply for a grant, no matter what, even if that's the situation you're in is to scramble at the last minute. Um, there is a lot of funding that's out there and the main obstacle I've seen is uh, people knowing that the grants exist and people feeling confident that they will actually be successful. So I want to say today that yes, you can apply. Yes, you can succeed for grants. Um, I have been uh, very fortunate to um, apply for and receive uh, over $100,000 of funding in the past five years. Some of that is for uh, organizational and project grants, and a lot of that money has actually gone to other artists. So I've applied for money to do a project. Some of that funding has been used to pay other artists. So there's a lot of money out, of, out there. That's, that's, as you can see, a um, significant chunk of money. Um, so I want to encourage you to, to, to apply for that money. Um, you, you can be just as successful as I can. It just takes patience uh, and commitment to uh, go through that grant application process. So be patient, don't get frustrated. Like I said, take your time, be thoughtful about the process uh, and don't give up. That said, you're not going to be successful with every grant you apply for. I've applied for many grants that I haven't received. Um, but when you do receive a grant, it sure does feel good. And all of that time you spent like yelling at your computer screen uh, is really <laughs> worth it in the end. Um, so to, re to reiterate the point about starting early, um, once you've found the grant you're gonna apply for, my advice is to put the deadline for the grant into your calendar. Put it in your phone calendar, write it on your paper calendar on the wall, put it in your Gmail calendar, put it in all the calendars, but don't just put a deadline uh, notification for the day it's due. Put in a notification for three days before it's due and a week before it's due and two weeks before it's due because you want to make sure to, um, like I said, take it little by little and don't scramble and like stress yourself out at the last minute because some of the things that you will need to prepare for most grant applications will take you multiple days, if not weeks, things like asking for letters of reference, getting your transcripts from other universities or other post-secondary education, those types of things, they don't happen with the click of a button. They take other people to do that work for you. Um, so that might take a week or two weeks to get some of those materials. Um, and also to you know set yourself up for success by always applying and submitting your grant, not the day it's due, but the day before it's due, ideally. Nothing is more frustrating than watching the clock tick down and missing a grant deadline because your computer crashed or because a file exploded on your computer or because you actually realized when you went to submit that submissions were already closed because they were in Eastern time zone, not Pacific time zone or things like that. So I will always encourage you to apply the day before. Sometimes what can also happen is depending on the system used to accept the grant applications, if there's like 500 people applying at the last minute, the system might slow down and it might crash. So that can also have an effect or even if it doesn't crash, but it can become overloaded. So for all kinds of technical reasons, apply early. So I will share my screen now and uh, start showing you some resources. Uh, start, share. Okay, screens are flipped here. So uh, the first thing I actually wanna talk to you about today, if I can get my mouse to work now, um, is this really great handy overview to grant writing that a friend of mine literally just published uh, last week. Uh, so this is, I'll again share the link to this, um, but this is just a really good overview that kind of talks about 
some of this stuff that I'll go through today, um, but in more detail. So I'll kind of graze through this now. This was written by Renee Leanne. Um, she is an artist and a uh, used to operate a music venue in Victoria, BC called the Copper Owl. So some of the things you'll see in here are specifically referencing BC arts grants, but are applicable to all kind of situations. Uh, and you can check out her website as well. Um, so like I said before, um, yes, grants can be intimidating and confusing. The key is to kind of be patient and look through things and not get overwhelmed before you get into it. So her first piece of advice here is to get clear on your project. And we'll look at this in more detail as well, is why? Like, the, what, what is the point of you applying for this money? Is it you just saw some money and you wanted to get it? Well, that's not necessarily a good reason to apply for a grant because you might not be eligible for that grant, or you might not have the experience or the credentials or what it, whatever it might be to actually apply for that grant. For example, something like shirk funding. Well, if you're an undergrad right now, you can't apply for it unless you are registered to go to, to take graduate studies or certain grants, you have to be a Canadian citizen or an Alberta resident to apply for it. So don't go around chasing grants just because they exist pick the right grants and make sure, you know, you're chasing the right uh, dragon or the right unicorn or pot of gold, or maybe is the right <laughs> metaphor. Um, so part of this getting clear on your project is the why. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this later, like I said, but this is how you're selling yourself. What is the idea? What is the pitch? What is the story that you're uh, telling to the jury uh, about what you want to do? Um, uh, so I was saying already, uh, find the right grant, make sure that, um, as she says here, it funds the kind of things you actually want to do as an artist. Um, it's the right region. It also, like, it's important, this advice is really great. Do you have time to apply for it? Don't freak out because you see a grant deadline coming up in two weeks and, and think like, oh no, I really should apply for this. Like, it's okay to let it go and not apply for grants either because if you stress yourself out applying for it and then still don't get it in the end, was it better to maybe spend your energy working on your practice or doing something else in a creative sense that's a better use of your time? Um, so here is one of the best pieces of advice that people often don't follow when they're applying for grants. Ask for help, ask for lots of help. This is how I've been successful with grants is by asking other artists and professors and people in arts and culture with, uh, can I see your past grant application? Can you provide feedback on my grant? Does it make sense? Um, don't be afraid to ask for that help. That's basically the reason why I'm hosting this workshop today is to proactively say, I want to help you uh, get some grants, um, but don't be afraid to ask other people that you know who have done work in grant writing for help as well, because they will generally speaking, always be happy to help you as well. Um, so one of the other most important parts is making sure you have all of the relevant elements for any grant application. Um, we'll look at this again in more detail later for the other specific grants, but most grants you're going to need the same kind of materials for all grants. That is not to say that you can recycle them exactly verbatim for every grant application though. For most grants, you will need to tailor it, excuse me, to their specific uh, guidelines. So maybe sometimes it'll say the CV can only be two pages or it can only be four pages. Or with Shirk, you have to use a specific kind of online portal to upload your CV into their portal. Um, the artist statement might be 100 words, it might be 400 words. Um, your project proposal might need to be one page or it might need to be four pages. So uh, always look at the guidelines very specifically for the grant you're going to apply for. Um, and uh, with budgeting, um, again, sometimes this is applicable, sometimes it's not. Certain grants or scholarships, there, there is no budget component and others there is. Um, so also make sure you're looking into um, um, the, the guidelines for, for budgeting, what is an eligible expense and what are ineligible expenses. Um, sometimes this is kind of unclear and uh, back to the point of asking for help. Most 
places you're going to apply for funding to, you can ask the people who work for that funding agency for advice. Please do phone them and ask them for advice because that is kind of their job to help you out as well uh, to navigate the application process. Um, but a point I will emphasize here that uh, Renee has included here as well is make sure that you pay yourself properly as well. So it, often the way an artist actually gets money through the grant isn't by, you know, uh, writing in just living expenses. It's by writing a fee for yourself for your time because your time is worth money. And I will always emphasize that, especially for younger artists, emerging artists, your time is worth money. So please always charge for your time. Don't give it away for free. Um, but make sure that you're thinking about that component of the grant budget as well. Um, and I really love how she's emphasized this here is ask for more help. So that could be asking someone to proofread your grant proposal. That could be phoning the AFA and asking your grant consultant for advice. That could be asking, you know, your prof to proofread something that also uh, involves things like asking for letters of reference. Um, that is a really strong element that sometimes isn't part of the guidelines, but that you can submit um, kind of proactively, I guess. Um, maybe that's not the right way to say it, but that to include letters of reference, even if they're not a required element, is it, it looks good. Um, sometimes, depending on the grant, they will say, don't submit anything that we don't ask for. Um, but letters of reference, you know, especially if it's from a, a tenured professor or anyone from your professional experience testifying to the competency of your, you know, work and your ability to complete a project, that really helps your grant um, proposal out a lot. Um, and then finally, um, as I said, you know, submitting it on time is crucial. If you miss the deadline, you won't be considered. So that goes back to my first point that I made, which is start early. Um, start early and take it bit by bit, work on your grant application for like half an hour a day, you know, for three days in a row. Don't try to jam it all in the last few days um, because the more you uh, work on it and then go away and then look at it with fresh eyes, the stronger you'll make things like your project proposal. Okay, um, so, um, most grants, as we said, kind of involve the same elements within the application process. Maybe I'll just go back to uh, this slide for now. Um, so you're gonna have things like perhaps a cover letter, um, a budget reference letter, a CV. Um, like I said, you wanna revi like revise and reformat these for every grant opportunity. You can't just like copy paste and recycle them. Um, it's important to remember that when you're applying for a grant, it's not just going to a robot who's going to assess whether it's approved or denied. It's going to real human people. Uh, jury panels are made up of your peers, uh, generally speaking, people who are also artists or are arts administrators. Um, so you need to remember that you need to write your grant proposal for the audience who will read it. Um, and that also means things like not just following the guidelines, but paying attention to grammar and spelling and um, using the language of the discipline that you're applying um, uh, for the grant agency you're applying to as well. So um, while things like your CV and your bio and those types of things are important, I wanna emphasize that the project proposal um, is by far, generally speaking, the most important part of any grant proposal. So this is where you're selling your idea. This is like your pitch. Um, you need to like create a narrative uh, with that project proposal about not just yourself, but about the project. What is the value? What is the meaning of that project? And what will the results and benefits be? So will this project you're proposing, will it make the world better? Will it make your career better? Why do you deserve this money? Um, you need to kind of justify yourself and your project through the project proposal. And we'll look at this uh, from some examples that I've done a little, bit later, uh, a little bit later, but another way to think about this is that the project proposal is like a cover letter for a job application. That's probably a more relevant thing that people have applied for lots of jobs. So think of your grant proposal that way. You want to also tailor 
your project proposal to the grant guidelines. So it might say something like, um, or to think of it this way, when you write a cover letter for a job, you look at the job posting very carefully and write your job cover letter to like using the language of the job posting. You wanna do the same thing with your project proposal. It should have some of the same language that the grant guidelines have. This might be things like saying, yes, uh, say if you're applying for an AFA grant, that yes, your project will enhance the vitality of arts and culture in Alberta, things like that. So it's useful to look at the mission and vision of the funding agency that you're applying to, because if your, your grant proposal is aligned properly with what their mission and vision is, then you have a very high chance of being successful, or at least a better chance than if your grant is not at all aligned with, you know, the place you're applying to. Um, it's also helpful to think to yourself, what would I want to read in a grant application if I was on the jury? So, um, you know, pay attention to, again, grammar and spelling, but make sure your idea is clearly expressed. If you can send it to your parents, like if your mom or dad, who might not be an artist, can read your grant application and say, that makes sense to me. Yeah, that sounds like a good thing to give money to. That might be a good kind of litmus test <laughs> um, that I often do. I have my partner read my grant application sometimes and she'll say like, yeah, this makes sense or this part doesn't make sense. What are you actually saying there? So having someone read it who's not just within the arts, but also someone who has kind of a, um, what's like an objective uh, third party is a useful way to um, look at things as well. Okay, so I can't actually, the way I have my screen set up here, I can't see if there's any questions. So does anyone have a question currently before I keep blathering away? Seeing none, I will continue. Um, maybe Lee, if someone, if you do see like a raise hand, just you can interrupt me. Okay, so the first thing we'll look at here is um, uh, AFA grant funding. So you can all see this page here still. I hope you see a different screen than you did before. Okay, great. So um, with any grant, um, you're going to want to refer to the source of information. Everything I'm saying today is helpful tips from past experience, but I am not the authority on AFA grants and I'm not the authority on SHRC grants. So you need to go to the source and look at that information in detail. Um, so what I'll look at today with AFA grants is specifically individual grants. Um, the AFA also funds things like organizational grants, um, but I'm going to specifically look at uh, individual grants here. So you can see on their website that you can filter grants for uh, individuals. Um, maybe I'll quickly point out that um, the AFA does have four different types of scholarships as well. Um, these scholarships are unfortunately only available to students under the age of 25, so old fogies like me are not uh, eligible, but there are a variety of other grants that the AFA does. Uh, for example, the Emerging Curator Fellowship is another really excellent opportunity that I would encourage people to apply for. Um, but I'll specifically look at uh, um, your, um, individual grants today. Um, the other thing I'll say, uh, just as a note before we kind of go through, oh, what happened here? Um, um, that right now with the AFA grant programs that are specifically in regards to travel are, some of them are suspended, but if your individual grant is a proposal to travel Europe to look at art galleries and do research, it's very unlikely that will get funded because obviously of the COVID-19 global health pandemic. Um, so we'll look at this a little bit later when I get to some examples, but um, I, in my last grant application, actually specifically wrote a small section addressing COVID concerns with my current project I'm working on. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind that you need to take into account the kind of global context of things like that within your grant application. Um, okay, so uh, let me just get my screen going again here. Um, so I'll just mention with the scholarships through the AFA, the deadline for that is not until March 1st. Um, so definitely take some time to look at that if you are under the, or 25 or under. Um, but I'll focus here on individual grants. 
Um, with the AFA grants, um, because it's, uh, and just to be clear that the AFA means the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, um, which is the largest um, governmental source of funding for arts and culture in the province of Alberta. Um, you do have to be legally entitled to work in Canada and to have your primary residence in Alberta for at least one full year. So if you're an international student, Depending on your circumstances, or if you've moved to Alberta, you may be eligible, um, but you will definitely want to speak to the AFA directly to confirm your eligibility criteria. Um, um, so with uh, individual grants, they're kind of sectioned into disciplines. Um, so you can see here, uh, you have dance, individual project funding, uh, film and video. So the categories the AFA have, um, our dance, film, indigenous, literary, music, theater, and visual arts slash new media. Basically, the application is very similar for each of these. So I'll kind of um, treat them all the same, um, which they do have individual um, you know, discrepancies in the application process. But the main part of the project proposal is very similar. So it's just up to you, depending on what, dis what discipline you're involved in as to which stream you would apply to. Um, so these individual funding grants do have two separate deadlines every year, uh, September 1st and March 1st every year. And the total maximum you're eligible to apply for is $15,000. So um, last year I applied for funding to um, the individual um, visual arts and new media individual project funding to pay for the first year of my master's studies and I was successful that with that so we'll look at that specific application because that might be something that you want to also apply for to fund your tuition and fund your living expenses but when we look at this project um, my my application you can also think of it you could substitute going to school for something like doing artistic research or other things. So it's not to say that the AFA is only to apply for tuition funding. It could be to um, do curatorial research, what I, which I've also been successful in getting funding for that in the past, or traveling Europe to do research on art galleries, or it might be to develop a new piece of dance choreography, or to write an album, or record an album, or to produce a, a multimedia installation of some sort. So there's lots of different things you can do, and we can maybe get into some specifics uh, and questions about that later. So. Um, I'm going to take you to this uh, web page on the AFA site uh, just to go through some of the elements of applying for a grant. Um, I will include this in the, um, uh, the materials later. This is basically walking you through the entire application process. It's a very, very helpful resource from the AFA, so please do consult it. Um, the first thing, which is not exciting, which you do have to do for most grants though, as it says here, before you do anything else, you need to register for their gate system. So it's the, 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 the online portal to apply for a grant. And it can take perhaps five business days to process. So again, reiterating my start early, uh, don't leave it till the last minute because you wouldn't even be able to get your account up and running to apply for the grant. So um, even if you're not gonna apply for an AFA grant for like a year or two years or two months, go get, signed up for GATE right now, because then when you want to do it, it'll be already ready to go. Um, so when you're applying for an AFA grant, you'll have, like I said, pick what your discipline is, but the four main categories you can apply for within individual project funding are these four here, which are art production. So this could be like, I want to spend the next six months painting, making new paintings in my studio. It could be research, which would be, you know, I want to go research a bunch of uh, feminist artists and then write a book about it. It could be for marketing, which might be something like I've recorded an album. Now I want to market it and promote it to the world or training slash career development, which might be like, I want to pay for my tuition at the University of Lethbridge. Um, so when you're applying for these grants, it's always important to pick your start and end dates to make sure that um, what you're doing is not necessarily something you've already started. So if you've already started doing a project and you say that you want funding for it, 
generally speaking, the AFA does not fund things that you've already started. So I won't get into detail on that, but it's important to think about the time frame of the activities you're going to do and the eligibility period for your funding. Um, as they say here as well, that your funding application will be assessed by a panel. Again, think about who the audience is reading your grant application. Um, and again, allow yourself lots of time to apply for that grant. Um, but as I mentioned before as well, the arts development consultants are experts in these grants. So please do reach out to them. They can give you feedback on your grant. They can answer questions. And if you give them enough time, they'll actually review your grant application and give you feedback on it, which is incredible. Most grant agencies do not do that. So please take advantage of that. Um, from my experience, you need to do that at least one month before the deadline. Within the last month up until the deadline, they're really busy organizing the people to serve on the juries that review the grants, so they won't have time to review your grants. Um, so um, what we'll look at now, maybe I won't actually look at the gate system, um, but I'll look specifically at my grant proposals so you can see the materials that I've submitted. Here we go. Everyone can see that, I hope, still. And I'm not sure if anyone has any questions at this point or. All right, cruising along. Tyler, um, sorry, I have a question. You yeah. said that um, the AFA don't does not fund projects that have already started. Does that apply for continuing um, studies or students who are in their yeah. second year? No, that's an excellent question, Moya. So um, um, you can break things down into years. So you can only do a, the maximum amount of time, I believe you can do a project is 12 months with the AFA. So for my first year of my graduate studies, I applied with the time period between September 1st, 2019 and August 31st, 2020. So that's 12 calendar years. So my first, my application we'll, we'll look at now was for my first year of grad studies. And then for the September 1st deadline that just happened, you know, six weeks ago, I made another similar application to fund my second year of graduate studies. So it's not that you can't, now that you've started school, you can't apply. It's that you wouldn't be able to apply for things that you've already paid for. What you could do is apply uh, you'd have to think about the timing, but you could definitely, let's say if you had just started grad school this year, you could apply for the next academic year, or what you could also do is apply starting in March for the March deadline to pay for, let's say your summer semester and things proceeding from that. Or you could say, maybe in your case, Moya, um, next, um, let's say next April, you're going to go do some field work and to go do some research. You could apply for funding to go do that field work and artistic research, which would start after the March 1st deadline. So, um, yeah, it's not that you have, it depends how you define the project, but you can break it down into sections like that. That's a great question. Uh, any other questions at this point? Okay, so I'll just look through this um, project proposal here. If you go back to the AFA website, this page shows you the kind of step-by-step -step of the application. And you can also see here the detailed project description. This is one of the most important. So they're calling it detailed project description. What I was describing it was project proposal. And this is the four you know, as, as they say right on the website, previous successful applicants have structured their project descriptions this way, which is their suggestion of saying, please do it this way. So, <clears throat> so these four key sections are exactly the four key sections that I used in my project proposal. So the first here, um, you know, here's my information. Basically this introduction section is the kind of about me. You can think of it like the, you know, cover letter sort of but it's me saying, here's who I am. I'm a curator, I'm a writer. This is what my interests are. This is some of the projects I've done in the past. This is what I wanna do next. Who, who, who am I and why am I here asking for money today? The second section is then the objective. So what is the point of me asking for this money? So 
um, like I said, this specific grant application was to apply for my first year of funding for grad school. Um, it could be something different, um, but this is just the example we have here today and I can send other um, applications uh, later as well so you can see the difference between them. Um, but again, what's important why I wanna walk through this is to think about the importance of that crafting a narrative telling a story, selling your idea. This is what the project description needs to do. It can't just be, give me money to make some paintings. It has to really say why those paintings are important, why your artistic practice is important to you, what it means to your career trajectory, all those kind of things. So just I'll kind of, kind of glaze through this, but you can see here, the way I framed it was, I am an independent curator. I want to develop a specific area of expertise. How will I do that? by pursuing my master's. Um, so your funding will pay for the first year of my studies. Very kind of clear and straightforward. Um, here is some of the things I'm working on right now. As I've been working on those, I realized I could develop a specific area of expertise. Um, so by giving me funding, I will develop a niche for my work as a curator and writer by being more specialized in the uh, the realm of sound art uh, or sound and uh, society. Um, so then this section is kind of more academic-y and when we look at my shirk proposal you can see it's very similar but saying what what is what is this all about? What is sound art? What is sound theory? What is sound studies? So this is me kind of explaining why this grant is important, the kind of theoretical foundation of the work I'm going to do. Um, so having that explanation there is important but also making sure that your explanation, the selling your idea is not so jargony that someone who is perhaps a dancer might read your application to do a curatorial project. If it's full of curatorial jargon and you know BS talk, it's not good. Write your grand proposal in relatively plain speak. Yes, do use you know references or use um, some of the vocabulary of your discipline, but don't write something that some, like the person who's reading your application is gonna glaze over and say, wow, this person is really trying to show off with their grant application. Just make your point clearly um, and sell that idea clearly um, in, in the proposal. Um, so the next section here um, is exactly what you're going to do. So in the objectives, it's saying broadly, what is the point of this application? But the planned activity section needs to be specific, needs to specifically say, well, one of the activities I'm gonna do is research. So this research will come through my coursework. Um, what is the program? Giving them information about, you know, is this just a, a, a one week workshop somewhere or is this a university level program? Give them the, sell them on the credentials of the, the uh, career training, uh, your, what, whatever you're going to do, um, that it's not just some thing that you've invented yourself, it's a legitimate, um, you know, recognized place where people go study or people do a residency or a workshop or take a graduate uh, degree, whatever it might be. So you can see here, I've kind of outlined like what I'm doing, I'm doing research, I'm doing writing. And in the timeline, I've actually specifically said, these are the classes I had registered for or was planning to register for. Um, so you get into real detail in that planned activity section. Um, and then finally, what will it do? So you've said who you are, then you've said, what's the point of this? And then you've said, what exactly will you do um, with this funding? And then the most important part I think often is the, what will it mean? What will the results be? What will, what will happen once I do this thing I say I'm gonna do? So you can see in this section, I've said like, this will take my career to the next level. Um, I will, you know, in curatorial work, people maybe kind of scoff at you if you don't have a master's degree. Well, then I'll have a master's degree. They'll still maybe scoff at me, but <laughs> that's not, neither here nor there. Um, it will, you know, open up future work opportunities because I have that credential. Often, if you're applying for a job as a curator at a museum or gallery, they won't look at your application if you only have a BFA. Um, so this, this section here is really kind of saying why this is important, but it's also in a way saying, 
it's worth it for you, AFA jury, to spend the money on me because here's what it will do. Um, so because most of the places you're going to apply for grant money, literally they have to be transparent and accountable, right? It's often taxpayer money that they're giving out to grant recipients. So you, they need to, just as you need to, justify what you're going to do with that money. So think of it in that way as well. You're justifying why this is a good um, expense for the provincial government to give you money to, to learn something. Um, so any questions once we've kind of looked at that? We've got about 20 minutes left and I want to take questions about the AFA stuff uh, and talk about some other stuff. And I'm not sure if everyone will be interested to talk about SHRC, but um, yeah, if, if anyone has questions right now, please do ask. Oh, okay. Well, I'll show you a couple other things um, from applications so you can see some of the other materials that you'll need to prepare. Um, so one here, so this is my other application for 2020. You can see how I've actually written a section about COVID into the grant application. I don't know if this is a successful or a failure. Um, I don't find out till December. Uh, that's a, actually a really good point for me to make as well that most grants, you won't find out if you got it or not for perhaps three to six months, depending on the funding agency. Some, it could be you know a week or three weeks, but often you're gonna have to be patient. So when you're thinking about making your application, think about, um, you know, think two years ahead. I usually try to always think two years ahead in terms of my professional slash artistic practice because it takes a long time to get things going and to apply for the money for the first year to then get the money to do the actual thing in the second year. And then what do you do in the third year? Like it's, it's helpful to always be thinking that far ahead because these things do take time, um, especially um, we're not talking about Canada Council funding today, but the Canada Council takes like at least six months, usually, if not more, to get your information, uh, to get your results back, depending on the, the deadlines and stuff. Um, so um, I'll maybe just show you briefly the budget. Um, so this is an example of the budget that I use to apply for the first year of grad studies. Um, what's really helpful in all grant applications that there is a budget component is what's called projected revenue. That's a fancy way of saying, what money are you putting into this? Are you just asking for $15,000 and that's it? That's not the way it works. You need to actually have some quote unquote skin in the game to get some of these grants. And this an AFA is exactly one of those. So you can see here, this is the cost of me going to university for one year of, of master's studies. This is paying my rent, this is paying my bills, it's paying for my vehicle insurance, it's paying for my medical insurance, it's paying for textbook, it's paying for my tuition. Um, this, this is something you would actually have to do on their online form. You don't submit a PDF, but um, what it's not showing is here is that the total expenses for this project are something like $30,000. The AFA is only giving me $15,000 for that first year of studies, but you can see, because I've been lucky to get other scholarships as well, that I'm putting my own money into this project as well. So I'm also putting in, you know, another $15,000 to make up that $30,000 overall budget. Um, so if you're pre preparing an AFA grant application, um, again, please do send me an email and ask for help um, because the budgeting thing can be tricky in terms of what you are allowed to use as an eligible expense or not. Um, but anyways, I won't go into crazy amount of detail right now. Um, just to show a few other things that are part of the AFA grant application. So the, whether you're going to a workshop or taking grad studies or doing a pottery uh, residency, anything like that, it's, you need to give them all of the backup information for the thing you're going to do. So in my case, it was, yes, I'm actually registered. Here's the actual tuition. I didn't just make up that number. Here's the actual tuition fee expense sheet from the university. Here's the program I'm taking. Here's, you know, you can see it's a legitimate real university. <laughs> Here's the information about the program. Um, so the more kind of backup information you can give, the better your application looks. So I even, you know, included bits of the course catalog, um, all of that kind of stuff. 
Um, and, oh, I accidentally hit the wrong button. Let me just start share again. No, oh, am I sharing the wrong screen? Uh, we are seeing parts of the course catalog. Okay, cool. Um, you also see here the CV with the AFA, I believe it's four page maximum. The AFA also requires that you include support materials. So this is basically like a portfolio of saying, here's a bunch of curatorial projects I did, um, you know, uh, backup of your artistic practice. Um, this is letters of support. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this probably already, but when you're asking for letters of support, ask for them one month ahead of time. If you're asking for a reference letter, like three days before your grant is due, you'll either get a very bad reference letter because they don't have time to write you a good one, or you will get no reference letter, which might be something that will actually disqualify you um, from, up, from like, with most grants, they go through two steps. One is, here's all the stuff you submitted, did you submit all the right stuff? If you didn't, they won't even look at it. You won't even get to the second step, which is review by the jury. So um, yeah, again, like I said, over and over, <laughs> start early, ask for things early, like your reference letters. Um, and okay, so then this is um, uh, Shirk material. So um, maybe I will leave it there and just again ask, does anyone have, questions about AFA stuff, and then I can look a little bit at SHRC um, application as well. Nope, okay. Hi, sorry oh. folks, um, I can't find my hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, give me a second, it's Andrew here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'll see if I can flip on my camera for you, there we go. Could I just jump in a little bit on the AFA experience? Sure, is that, brief. is, that, is that okay? Briefly, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was on the uh, jury uh, 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 last year, 2019. So there are a couple things I could add to this. Um, Tyler, just to pick up on one of the last things you said about um, uh, getting your foot in the door uh, initially and, you know, making sure you have all the right materials for your application. I would strongly suggest that if uh, applicants have um, uh, a project that involves presenting media in some form, that media be your best, best quality when you submit. Um, it's quite amazing how um, uh, applicants with poor media, uh, these applicants, these applications may not be dismissed immediately, but they're often set aside. And the uh, applicants that are presenting with really high quality media, that can be really, really important. Um, there's just one other bit from a previous question. Was it, um, I'm sorry, I don't know all of, all of you. Uh, it was a question about um, el ineligible expenses uh, for AFA. And one point that I thought, um, I think you touched on this, Tyler, but I maybe just wanted to reinforce it a bit, is that I believe uh, ineligible expenses are also prior, uh, prior incurred, incurred uh, expenses to an artist or a project. You know, so if you've already um, had to pay that expense, um, a student loan, a credit card debt, uh, that is, you know, keeping you afloat. I've been there. Um, uh, that is ineligible if, if that's been, you know, a prior, a prior expense. Yeah, no, that's um, that's a great addition. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah. yeah, the in terms of eligible or ineligible expenses, and that's kind of what I mentioned earlier. Make sure you're thinking far ahead because if you start doing a project and then you write a grant for it, you might find out that because you started, you can't then um, those expenses become ineligible. Um, but Andrew's point about the materials that you submit for your grant application should always be very good. Don't submit bad quality images. You know, again, whether this is your CV or your cover letter or your portfolio, make sure it's proofread, make sure it is well formatted, make sure it looks sharp. Um, because like Andrew said, if the materials get to the jury and they look bad, then it kind of reflects poorly on your, um, your, your grant proposal. So. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, and it's just as I think you've stressed this as well. It's just that these expert panels have a limited amount of time. And so you really want to um, make sure you're not um, 
monopolizing their time with poor quality materials. Yeah. Cool. So maybe I'll move on to the um, um, shirk kind of materials briefly here. Um, so before I get into too much detail, what I will say is um, the focus of this is for those who are pursuing research in social sciences and humanities. So in Canada, there's called the Tri Council, uh, SHRC, which is um, stands for Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Um, for those who are studying health or natural sciences, you'd be looking to um, apply to NSERC, which is National Science Engineering Research Council, or CIHR, which is Canadian Institute of Health Research, something close to those acronyms. Um, so for these, um, you'll definitely want to, again, read the um, SHRC website as well as the SGS award site. Um, to be sure, SHRC funding is very competitive. Um, academic, yeah, academic excellence is worth 50% of the evaluation. So um, basically to qualify for even to get considered for the application, you have to have a GPA of 3.5 from your previous studies, whether that's as a master's student or as an undergrad. Um, and at the University of Lethbridge, I can't recall the number of um, social sciences and humanities students uh, on an annual basis, but there's only six Shirk um, scholarships awarded per year. So not very many going around. So it's even more important to, um, again, follow the guidelines, make sure that you are eligible and make sure that um, you have all of the, you know, um, criteria to apply for that grant. So um, that said, um, the SHRC is a really important grant to apply for. It looks really amazing if you're successful on it because it is kind of prestigious. Um, so definitely do take the time to apply for it. But again, like I'll say with the AFA grant, start early because if the, if the AFA grant looked kind of like a lot of work, the SHRC grant might be kind of like more work. Um, and it's mostly the same materials, but with SHRC, the difference is that for your CV, you are required to use the platform, which is called the Canadian Common CV Portal. So I'll briefly show you this just to see how exhaustive it is. But to be completely honest, it's horrible. It's a very bad system and you will yell at your computer a lot. And I think I took two weeks just to do the CCV part, which was me like a half an hour here, an hour there, because you're essentially taking your CV and reformatting it line by line into a really crappy computer system online. And I won't show you that portal right now, but I'll show you what it spits out in the end. Um, so basically you end up putting every single thing you could think of onto your CV and the way it's laid out is really mind numbingly uh, confusing. So if you do start applying for the SHRC grant, please again, feel free to email me and I can <laughs> help answer questions and show you the actual portal because it's, yeah, it's, I'll be honest, it's not fun. But again, it's totally worth it. So you end up listing basically all your disciplines, your degrees, any other grant you've ever gotten and the dollar amount they want to know. You need to list all of your employment things. So like I said, I am obviously older than 25. So I have a lot of things on here. So it take, take, took me a long time to do this as well. So it might not be quite as bad um, if you're you know, um, just entering academia or the professional kind of work environment. Um, but you can see here's all the different research funding, courses that I've taught, event administration, event participation, um, community activities, and some of these they also want you to write, you know, 150 words about what that was. So what was that volunteer thing you did? Tell us about it. Every presentation you've done, list them all, all the interviews you've done, if you've got publications, artistic exhibitions, recordings, blah, 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 blah. So um, with the CCV, again, my main advice is just start early, 
Um, I will also reinforce the aspect of giving your references lots of time to upload their references because with Shirk, they don't just send you a PDF that you can upload. They actually, you have to register them on the portal and then they get an email telling them how they can register for the portal. And then they have to submit their reference letter online so you never see it. So it's a way to like make sure you're not faking reference letters, but it just means it's actually more work for them. And it also takes time between your request for them to be a reference or a referee and when they actually get approved and registered. So again, definitely don't do it the last minute because you just it, it just won't work. You'll need more time than that. Um, the other thing with Shirk, um, so I'll just look at my actual application here. So this is the entire application. So this is, looks like basically what you're putting in on the research portal. So like I said, you'll have to register for a CCV account to, to upload your CV, but you also have to re register for on the research portal. And this is where you upload your, your application, much like the gate system for uh, AFA. Um, so it's not as complicated in some ways. Basically you have your proposal summary, which is the short version of the one page um, project proposal. So like I said before, you have to reformat things all the time. With the Shirk application, it's literally one page or 500 words. Um, and it's very like, if you submit two pages, they'll just throw your application away. <laughs> um, so again, look at the guidelines very specifically, but you can see that the Shirk application compared to my other one is really academic looking. It's got footnotes, it's got a whole bunch of, it's got, you know, an entire page of references. And um, because Shirk is, you know, a much more academic focused thing, it's, you know, it is an academic thing. Um, you need to tailor your project proposal for an academic jury of, of your peers versus a artistic jury of your peers. So just an important thing to remember there. Um, but the other thing I was going to say is also with Shirk, you will need to submit your transcripts. So transcripts can take like a long time. If you think it takes a while to get reference letters, transcripts can take even longer. So you have to, you know, get those transcripts and then they have to mail them to you sometimes through the physical mail, which now a days takes even longer. So again, Make sure you start early. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this at the outset, but the deadline, as I understand it, but you should check this for yourself on the SGS website, is December 1st. So you've got six weeks to apply for the Shirk grant, and you should start tomorrow by doing things like applying for your transcripts and getting them mailed to you and working on your CCV and um, asking, you know, just do the first step of contacting your past professors and just asking them to be a reference because that's the first step not just saying please write me a reference letter but saying hi remember me and how good we got along when i took classes from you two years ago would you please be my reference have i mentioned how handsome you are lately and how much i like you and though you know those kinds of things are important um so just a couple other things i'll say about the shirt Grant, since we're kind of at the end of our time here, make sure you start early. Um, like I said before, 50% of the Shirk grant is based on your academic standing. So if you had a 4.0 GPA as an undergrad, there's a better chance that you'll get the grant. So um, that's important. But 30% of the criteria is on research, what they call research potential. So that again is the pitch, what's the story, what's the project proposal, why is this important research that will make the world a better place or will contribute to a body of knowledge within your own discipline. Um, and yeah, like I said, the CCV is not fun, um, but 20% of that evaluation is based on what they call personal characteristics and interpersonal skills. So again, list everything you can think of, every volunteer experience, every conference you've attended, every you know, piece of writing you've published, whether it's in a zine or on a website or in a, in a, in a, in a book, um, write them all down because they're all valuable parts of your um, resume. So 
um, even though I've complained a lot about the CCV process today, I will say it was actually very helpful for me to literally go through my entire career and write down everything I've ever done, even though it's now kind of all scattered again. Um, it was worth it to like think through everything and write it all down so you have all of that kind of um, evidence for uh, to, to support your grant application. Um, yeah. In an ideal world, we're all keeping track of literally everything we do all of the time throughout our careers. And we don't have to sit there and think about it. Uh, the reality is, of course, no one, no one does that. Um, but you should, should do better. <laughs> yeah. And another good way to do this, and especially for assuming most of you all here are practicing artists or curators or arts professionals in some way. Um, one really good way to kind of keep up on this is just by having a basic website and using your website as like your CV, maybe not every aspect of your CV, but to capture all your projects and links to things you've written and you know exhibitions you've been in. Because like Andrew said, um, the jury is kind of pressed for time when they're looking at stuff. So, you know, if they receive your CV and the top of your CV is your name, your address, and then your website address, often, like I've been on juries myself as well, people go check out your website. And on some grant applications, they ask you to submit your web address if you have one. So if you have a nice website that shows all the projects you've done, um, that kind of is a shortcut for a, a jury member sometime though you know they're supposed to be reviewing your cv um if they go see your website and it's really clear and concise and shows all of the cool projects you've done that can also really boost your application as well so um my only other note here um in regards to shirk application is again i think i said this earlier but just to reiterate with the ccv don't try to do it all at once or you'll be sad and you'll like do an office space on your computer and smash it to bits. Do one bit at a time, like do one section at a time. On Monday, do your employment experience. On Tuesday, do your academic experience. On Wednesday, do your volunteer experience because you do literally have to do it line by line by line and you have to hit save and then back and then save again and then go back to the main page. So it's like kind of excruciating. But so like I said, just be patient and set yourself up for success by like starting early and doing it in small bits, like while you're watching TV is how I did most of my CV. But just make sure you're still doing it, um, you know, with precision and not missing things either. So um, yeah, maybe I'll just say if anyone has any other questions. Apparently you've explained things incredibly well. I guess so, 100% success rate for everyone who watched this workshop today. <laughs> Not guaranteed. Yeah, Jamie, you have a question. Uh, one quick question. Uh, once you've submitted the line by line by line by line, do, is that saved in their system for the next time you need to apply for one of their grants? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know what I can actually do? Here, let me... Uh, You're still seeing this? Yes. So I'm, sh I'm showing you the actual CCV portal just briefly now, um, because what you can do is it, it saves it. And then because um, Shirk is not the only agency that requires CCV, lots of other academic and government type things require you to submit your CV through CCV. Um, so it'll spit out different versions of your CV based on the, the agency. So I'll just show you that quickly. Um, uh, how do I do this again? Um, so I have like the, the CGS master saved and then you might generate other versions. So yes, it saves everything in kind of its main folder let's call it and then if you are um, applying for a different thing it'll spit out different versions depending on what you need to do but i'm i'm gonna fail to actually show you how that looks today but here you can see the um, um 
just uh, what it actually looks like. Here you go. Anyways, yeah, that's a good question. It's not like you have to do that whole process for every every grant you ever apply for. Great, thank you. Any other questions? None, I was expecting like a billion questions, but that's okay. Um, so anyways, I'll just, yeah, you can see this is the, all the sections you can input things into. So it's quite, um, quite painful. So like I said, go register for the CCV tomorrow and then just start chipping away at it bit by bit while you watch Gilmore Girls or Star Wars or, you know, hockey. I guess hockey doesn't exist anymore. Whatever you might watch. <laughs> um yeah so um that's about it what i'll leave you with is that uh, after this workshop like i said it's being recorded so it will be uploaded to the asterix website and i will compile a list of links and uh, some pdfs not everything that i've ever applied for but a couple of things as examples uh, removing my name and address probably is a good idea um, and that will be emailed out to everyone who participated here. Um, and as well, in addition to that, um, I'll just uh, point out that another resource that was recently developed by Asterix um, is called our um, Arts uh, Research Resource Guide. Um, so it has information on the stuff we've talked about today, but it also has a whole bunch of other information on different um, uh, resources, um, equipment, and um, uh, spaces and technology within the U of L, but also within the Lethbridge arts community. Um, basically, the point of that research guide is to help you do interdisciplinary research, but also to connect with others in different disciplines. So, if you are, um, you know, Moya being an anthropologist or a cultural anthropologist, maybe I'm not describing that correctly, but she might be looking to collaborate with some ceramic artists to do some research or do something. Um, or if you are a dancer and you're looking for a musician to collaborate with on a project, those are the kind of things that Asterix uh, Center for Research Creation wants to encourage. Um, so do check out that research resource guide because there's lots of great um, information in there to help you, you know, find out what's going on within arts and culture in Lethbridge and in Alberta, um, as well as at the U of L. Um, so uh anything else oh the one other thing i will mention is that on november 5th put this in your calendar november 5th sgs uh so the school for graduate studies i probably keep using that acronym over and over and you're wondering what the heck i'm talking about um sgs uh dear deirdre coburn who is the grants award administrator for sgs will be doing a workshop specifically on tri-council funding so she'll go into more detail on SHRC funding, but also NSERC and CIHR. So if you're in science or health or engineering, um, she'll give you better information than I did or just more uh, detailed and specific information um, as well. So yeah, if you do have any questions, like I said, you can feel free to email me uh, at t.stewart at ulf.ca um, and I'd be happy to share more resources or give you help with grants as you're writing them as well. Yeah, you can also um, always contact Asterix through asterix at uh, and we will be sending out a follow up to this with all of the links that we've talked about today. And that's always a way that you can reach us or, you know, Tyler through us. So please don't hesitate if you need any research support, uh, even if it's just pointing you in the right direction uh, to contact us and let us help support you. Cool. Well, we'll maybe hang around uh, on here a bit and chat, but feel free to depart. And yeah, thanks to everyone for attending and uh, uh, best of luck with your applications. <laughs>